Um, yeah, thanks everyone for this opportunity. Uh, essentially, I, I, I reached out because um, after I gave this talk at Amsterdam, I thought it would be nice to give the same kind of message in a more um, conversational setting, conversational tone, uh, and also to be able to ask any questions or to uh, have exchanges regarding the content. Um, it's fine from, from my perspective if people jump in with, with questions at any point or with the organizers, is that okay? Or should we hold it until the end? That's good. Okay. If it, if it starts taking too much time, you know, we'll know what to do. So okay. feel free to jump in. Alrighty. So no conflicts of interest. So this talk has two parts. Uh, the first about two thirds, we're going to be talking about something that of course is near and dear to all of us, uh, progress towards a cure for HIV. And then at the end, we're going to wrap up a bit with a summary of some of the advances in working on HIV vaccine uh, development. So uh, in the first part, towards potential cure for HIV, this is something that you'll all be familiar with, of course. Uh, we're fortunate that in modern days, for people who have access to antiretroviral therapy, uh, it's possible to suppress viremia to where someone is undetectable. And at that level, there's very clear evidence that those individuals are then untransmittable uh, as well. The problem, as you all know, the thing that we can improve upon is that uh, if we ever stop therapy, HIV invariably rebounds. So since this uh, talk was in Amsterdam, I thought I would uh, borrow from a, a locally appropriate story to try to come up with some metaphors to explain what we're doing to try to improve upon this. So I uh, talked about the story of the little Dutch boy. Um, the story goes that the boy sees a leak in the dam that's protecting his town and is able to temporarily uh, plug that hole with his finger and hold back the ocean. So this is another example of a life-saving but not perfect uh, permanent solution. So the Dutch boy here representing antiretrovirals. So we're gonna kind of borrow from that in talking about our different curative therapies. Um, how are we gonna improve upon this situation? In this metaphor, the HIV reservoir in a person is represented by, by the water in the reservoir. And the first thing we can do to give the Dutch boy a break is to try to drain the reservoir. So eliminate all HIV infected cells. And um, the second approach is maybe we can't get rid of the whole reservoir, but maybe we can do something to reinforce the dam here. So something to boost the immune response. Um, so all the water isn't gone, uh, the HIV reservoir is still there, but it's not doing any uh, damage. And you'll be familiar with the fact that this first approach is what we call sterilizing cure. We get rid of the virus, the reservoir completely. Uh, and the second is this functional cure or remission. So the different therapies that we're using to try to cure infection can be broken down by these different symbols. Uh, kick and kill, shock and kill. Of course, we want to reactivate latent HIV with drugs and then kill with the immune system. So that's one way of trying to, to drain this reservoir. Uh, another approach, so one type of gene therapy, we try to delete HIV out of cells. This is with different CRISPR approaches that target the HIV provirus itself. Uh, and this is another way to try to drain that reservoir of HIV. Um, there's a second type of gene therapy that doesn't target HIV itself, but tries to make other cells resistant to HIV. So for example, deleting CCR5, uh, and that doesn't drain this initial reservoir, but it stops the virus from spreading, so it's a way of containing the reservoir. Um, there's, there's a bit of background noise there. I don't know if, uh, if someone can go on mute, some typing and such, please. Um, and then uh, another ty type of way of having a functional cure of reinforcing that dam is vaccines and immunotherapies. We want to enhance immune responses to control virus. And a, kind of an outlier here, which is an interesting approach, is called block and lock. We're not trying to drain the reservoir, we're not trying to reinforce the dam, but we want to permanently silence HIV expression. So this is kind of like freezing all of the water in that reservoir so that it can't escape, force the virus into, into deeper um, latency. So um, we probably, though, shouldn't think of these two approaches as being completely separate. 
if we can have a smaller HIV reservoir, then it's more likely we can get the immune system to contain the bit of virus that's left. So these two approaches can be complementary. And uh, again, going back to some, some Dutch analogies, if we have a reservoir that looks like the ocean here, then we probably would need a very strong immune response to hold it back. But uh, drawing on my Canadian roots, if we have a smaller reservoir of water, uh, then we probably don't need as robust of an immune response to contain uh, the bit of a virus that is left. So that brings us to the first topic that I really want to go into, one of the areas that is an important challenge to the field and somewhere where we're making some progress. And, and that is, it seems like a simple question, but how do we measure the size of the reservoir that is left in someone who's on antiretroviral therapy? And there are two main ways that we can measure how much HIV is left. The first is a direct measure uh, where we detect HIV DNA or RNA in a cell, or also HIV RNA in the blood plasma. So this would be the standard viral load test if we're looking at the blood plasma, and this would be something like looking at cell-associated DNA. And the second approach is we can measure virus after reactivation. So we take those cells, we do something that's gonna stimulate them to produce HIV, so to force HIV out of hiding, out of that reservoir, uh, and then after some time, we measure how much virus is produced. And this is, an example of this is the QVOA, the quantitative viral load growth assay. Uh, that's kind of the gold standard for measuring replication competent virus. And that's really the advantage of this approach is since we're producing virus, we can really distinguish between the virus that's really replication competent, which is what we really want to get rid of. So, one of the first surprises in the field is that when we measure HIV using these two different types of approaches, we find that even though there may be a correlation, the, the magnitudes of the measurements are very different. So if we look at just all of the cells that have HIV DNA in them, we might have a thousand cells per million CD4 cells. This is in someone who's on therapy. But if we measure the frequency of cells that can produce infectious virus, it's more like one in a million. So th these are off by about a thousand fold. So really a pretty big difference. So is the size of the reservoir here the ocean or is it this small, this small pond to borrow from the past uh, metaphor? So why this discrepancy? And a big part of the answer to this, which was uncovered a few years ago now, uh, is that most of the HIV DNA is actually defective in people who are on therapy. So again, because we're going to come back to this metaphor a few times and be um, a bit uh, cute here and, and illustrate this uh, intact HIV genome as this, this, uh, this full-length uh, snake here. Whereas we might have HIV genomes that are defective. So we only have what we call the five prime part of the genome, so the head of the snake, or the three prime part of the genome, so the tail of the snake. And what we find if we just take cells out of people on long-term therapy and characterize their HIV DNA is that, uh, again, 98% are these kind of defective proviruses and only 2% are intact. And this is, this is really important because it's only these intact proviruses that are able to restart infection if someone stops therapy. So the first, uh, so that's one of the challenges and one of the advances that has been made recently is work from uh, Bob Silcano's lab, where they've developed a new assay, which is a scalable assay that can be used um, pretty relatively easily. But it can distinguish between these intact proviruses and these defective proviruses. Uh, and this is a type of droplet digital PCR assay. So these data, which I uh, are still um, unpublished, but were kindly contributed by Bob's lab. Uh, this is how much DNA each dot is from a different person living with HIV. So if we measure just one half of the HIV genome, we see a very large number. If we measure the other half, we get a very large number. If we use this new assay and just look at both halves together, we get a number that's closer to that real replication competent reservoir. Uh, 
Um, so again, this is a more selective measurement of intact proviruses, and it's faster, cheaper, and more scalable uh, than outgrowth assays. And this is something that a lot of the, the clinical trials that are, that are gearing up are starting to incorporate as one of their endpoints. And there's actually a, a company called Acelevir, which is, which is really um, making this uh, a high quality uh, reproducible assay that others can, can use. So that's one challenge. And if there's any questions about that part, please, um, please again, jump in at any point. So you so, feel like Bob's assay is, is ready to go? I mean, I, 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 we were, it's funny, we were at this CURE meeting at, at, at Hopkins and it's like, yeah, it's available to you, but are other people going to have access to it right away? Are we going to have to wait till it's validated? You know, there's a, this is like his third iteration. And I mean, I trust him more than anybody, but then, you know, Doug Richmond has a, a one and then another, and then there's Tilda. So, I mean, you know how people are from Missouri about these assays, especially. So, um, you, you know, you said other people are using them. Is that, that's really widespread. So if that's the case, that's great. Yeah. I mean, I think when the results get published, it's going to be, it would be a lot easier. Um, in, in the meantime, I mean, the information on the assay is, is, is uh, available in, in the patent. Uh, so I know some people are, are using that. Um, but as you say, these things move really quickly. So this assay uses two different probes, uh, two different colors, but the technology is advancing. So there's a new system that BioRad is coming out with that has four different probes, uh, which will be out, I think, just in, in a matter of months, which might let us even more precisely drill down on those intact proviruses. Um, so I think it's still to be determined how this all shakes out. Um, but I, I know a number of studies moving forward, including the ones that, that we're involved in, are using the, the intact proviral assay from, from Bob's lab. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that's one challenge, the makeup of the provirus. Uh, other challenges is, of course, the fact that we like to measure virus in the blood because that's relatively easy to access, but we know that there's other anatomical sites that harbor HIV. So we know it persists in particular in the follicles of the lymph nodes, which are areas that some immune cells, such as cytotoxic T cells, uh, don't really enter at high frequencies. And this is just one example. There's other tissues and compartments that uh, contribute to this. So what I want to propose is that if we really want to understand where the virus comes from when you stop therapy, we have to think of at least three different, uh, three different axes, essentially, on uh, characterizing this reservoir. We have to think about what's the composition of the provirus, the HIV DNA. Is it intact or is it uh, defective? We have to think about the cell type that that provirus is in. Is this a resting CD4 cell? Is it a macrophage? Is it an activated CD4 cell? We have to think of where that cell is. Is it in the lymph node? Is it in the blood? And if we put all of these together, uh, I'm going to suggest that there are probably nodes that disproportionately contribute to viral rebound. So this is a theoretical depiction right now. We don't have these data, but this is something we can aspire to. So maybe this node would be intact proviruses in resting CD4 cells in the lymph node, for example, um, or it might be, uh, might be something else. So I think if we can identify these nodes of rebounds, then that's really going to help guide and evaluate our cure strategies, of course. If we, if we measure it, then we'll have a better chance of being able to, to change it. Um, and until we have kind of a map of this, we do run the risk that measurements in clinical trials might miss an effect or give us a, a false negative signal as well. If we're just measuring HIV DNA and we don't see a change, we might think that we haven't done anything. But since most of that DNA is defective proviruses, uh, we could have actually reduced the, the intact proviruses that, that would have an impact. So I think that's an important concern. Um, and again, just to build on this a bit, so a partially effective intervention might hit the reservoir where, where, where we need to. Um, ineffective intervention might just be off uh, the mark. So how has this technology that we just talked about, this intact HIV DNA assay, contributed to this overall picture? 
uh, what it's done is narrow our resolution a bit on this axis. So now we can do a better job of distinguishing intact from defective proviruses and home in a little bit on the reservoir that matters. And of course, the field needs to continue to make progress on these other axes as well. So we know where to measure the reservoir and what cell types uh, to measure the reservoir. Uh, so the main point to leave on before switching to the next topic is I think there still is quite a lot of, of basic uh, science and observational uh, clinical studies to be done um, to continue to build our knowledge on, on what the reservoir is. And that's only gonna help our efforts to try to, to deplete. Um, so the next topic is quite different, clonal expansion. So if, if, if there are any other questions, topics, comments about measuring the reservoir that people would like to bring up? Any questions, anybody? Pretty clear. Okay, good. All right, so the next of three topics that I thought were really important presently in the field is the issue of, of clonal expansion of the HIV reservoir. Uh, so we've known for a long time that we can clone uh, sheep, but what we've learned more recently is that HIV infected cells can clone themselves uh, in our bodies. And we've known for um, a fairly long time that cells with defective proviruses can clone themselves. So these cells can proliferate, I mean. But more recently, several groups have shown very clearly that cells with intact HIV proviruses can also proliferate and undergo clonal expansion. And not only does this happen, actually, the reservoir is really dominated by these expanded clones. This is really the majority of what makes up the uh, infectious reservoir in people on long-term therapy. So there's a bit of a, a paradox at first here. We know that infected cells can proliferate, but we've also known for much longer than that, that the overall size of the HIV reservoir, as measured by Cuboa, uh, is really pretty stable. If anything, it decreases slightly. So how do we have proliferation of some cells without an overall increase in the reservoir size? I think it really clearly implies that some infected cells uh, have to be dying off just for, just for the math to work uh, on this. So that kind of implicit suggestion was shown explicitly by, uh, by Bob Silicano's group, where they looked over time at these different clonal populations and saw that at one time point, you might see that one clone, so clone two here, was very numerous and the other clone was not. And another time point, the situation had, had reversed itself. So, so this, I think, is really important in showing that the HIV reservoir is, is dynamic. Uh, we would have thought for a long time that infected cells just survive for a long time and reactivate periodically, but that's about it. Now we're finding that, that there's actually a, a lot of expansion and contraction of clones, and we're not really sure what the forces are that, that govern that in vivo at this point. And the reason why I think that is important is it gives us the possibility that the reservoir can undergo evolution. So now we're not talking about the virus itself evolving and replicating because if there's any replication happening at all, it's happening at very low levels. But we're talking about the HIV infected cell uh, itself. So what are the requirements for evolution to occur? We need some variation in the initial population. So we have different clones of infected cells and they differ from each other in, uh, in, in, in some ways that we don't fully understand. We need those biological units to be able to replicate and for the progeny of those, so the daughter cells to have the same DNA. And, and now we have that because we have clone expansion. And we need selective pressure, so different clones would have to die at different rates. And it's been suggested that some clones that persist might have a proliferative advantage based on where HIV integrates into the genome. Um, there's a few studies from 2014 that suggested this. Um, but what I would suggest is that these clones might also have a survival advantage. So is it possible that the cells that live for a long time are somehow resistant to being killed. They've undergone some evolutionary process, some selection to being killed. And these are, these are 
hypothetical questions that are enabled by this clonal expansion. They're not things that we fully have answers to. But there have been some studies recently that suggest that this might be the case. So uh, a study here showing that this protein called BRK5, which is also called Survivin, is expressed at higher levels in HIV-infected cells, so their survival potential is relatively high. Uh, a study, again, showing this BCL2, which is a protein that enables survival, is present at higher levels in HIV. Uh, and our own work finding that when we take these real infected cells from people living with HIV, they have been harder to kill than we would have expected uh, with CD8 T cells. And maybe that's something that is a result of um, the cells having been selected in vivo, something that we're following up on uh, now. So in my mind, this is really one of the critical questions being asked in the field. It's not, um, if it's not the case that infected cells just live for a long time and we can wake them up and kill them, if it's the case that cells are dying all the time and being replaced by other cells that are expanding, then I think that really suggests different types of interventions to, to try to uh, reduce or eliminate the reservoir in, in these people. Um, so that's, that's the, the second of three parts um, and kind of the more potentially controversial part uh, of the talk. Greg, could you maybe describe what you think some of those different therapies might be? I mean, just the idea that it wax and wanes is like, God, suppose you get it on a bad day, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think one thing that we're seeing some success with in vitro uh, are a type of agent called BCL2 inhibitors. So in particular, a, a drug called venetoclax, which is, which is used to treat um, different types of, uh, of lymphoma. And so if these cells have been selected for overexpressing survival factors, if you come in and you inhibit these survival factors, then that alone might be enough to encourage these cells to die. Uh, and that's what we're seeing at least in these in vitro studies, using cells directly from people living with, um, with HIV. So uh, it's certainly the case that in, in, in you know, the cancer field, different types of, of, of tumors are known to develop ways to evade the immune system. And there's a lot of those pathways that we might be able to exploit uh, as well here. And what kind of toxicity does that agent have? Yeah, so that's something, it's kind of, I would say, and I would preface this by saying I'm not a, a physician, so I, I'm just simply passing on what I've heard from conversations with physicians. I think it's essentially on the cusp of what might be considered acceptable. So people with, with CLL, with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, will take this drug for years on a daily basis, and they tolerate it for years. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does come with some side effects like neutropenia, where neutrophil counts are way down, and um, nausea and some other uh, unpleasant side effects. So it's not, it's not benign, um, but there are people who tolerate it for, for years. But it's not as good as Brad? some high agents, right, that we've, we've been using. Not, not as good as what, sorry? Not as, as toxic as some of the LRA agents that we've, we've been using, you know, in the past, recent past. Yeah, I... I stuff like that. Yeah, I'd shy away a bit from, from giving a side-by-side -side comparison myself, again, just by, because I'm not, not a physician, so I read the product inserts and such, but I, I think that might be a fair, a, a fair assessment, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, Brad, this is uh, Mark Wagner from the I4C. Um, have you thought about looking at uh, the pure energetic system since it does have an effect on both uh, autophagy and apoptosis and perhaps the role of P2X7 in, in this whole scenario? Yeah, I think that's a really good comment. I mean, that actually just kind of came onto my radar a few days ago when someone else had made the suggestion to me. So I haven't uh, had too much time to to read up on it, but maybe you can tell us a bit more about that. Well, I mean, P2X7 is an iron gated channel and when extracellular ATP activates it, um, it causes the efflux of potassium from the cell, which um, activates the inflammasome, which 
can go into apoptosis or it can also activate uh, autophagy. Mm -hmm. So it has, you know, more than one, you know, potential um, venue that it could be going and who knows how all these things are regulated, you know, at each level and how they will differ from patient to patient. Um, my results looking at patients expression of P2X7, which we're going to be expanding upon at, at the University of Pittsburgh, um, will give us a better understanding of um, how the expression of P2X7 is in pa these patient populations. So far, it seems to be downregulated, which is counterintuitive in a chronic inflamed state, inflammatory state. I would have anticipated to see uh, an overexpression, not an underexpression. Mm -hmm. Good. That's that's very interesting, and I think you know, as 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 you highlighted there as well, that's you know, there's there's a number of different pathways that could be governing this. Increasing autophagy, I think, is is really um, one of the more important ways of exploring. There was that uh, nice cell host and mic microbe paper that came out just a few weeks ago on this as well. So that's absolutely, um, thanks for, for bringing that up and highlighting that. And what is sure, auto thank you. What is that, autophagy? Well, autophagy is one way of housekeeping of uh, materials that are not needed by the cell. So in some cases, it's actually good, but in other cases, it can be bad. Uh, apoptosis is the actual death of the cell. So it creates a scenario that will kill the cell. So the other one is just more a cleaner upper. And that's and what's more considered, yes, housekeeping. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, thanks. Good, thank you. But HIV itself affects that as well. So, you know, that, uh, you know, needs to be explored more in depth on how that, how it is to the advantage to the virus as opposed to the host. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think um, something that's really moving onto everyone's radar uh, in the field now and something that, uh, and I'm going to be reading a lot more on as well. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, other comments on this part? Alrighty. So we've talked a bit about challenging and measuring the reservoir, the dynamic nature of the reservoir, the fact that the HIV reservoir might be primed for survival. So uh, just, I think, a few thoughts on how we might use this to interpret results of uh, clinical trials. And before doing that, introducing a concept that I think most people on the call will be very familiar with, which is kick and kill or shock and kill. You reactivate latent HIV expression in an infected cell, uh, and then a cytotoxic T cell uh, is able to sense and eliminate those, those cells, um, assuming that those cells aren't somehow uh, resistant to, to being killed, which is, I think, an interesting potential point. So cytotoxic T cells, their job is to hunt and kill virus-infected cells. Here it is in red. Here's the target cell. Uh, very shortly after encountering it, we can see the innards of the cell leaking out, and we have a fluorescent dye that turns that cell uh, green. So just a kind of a fun movie, not a, not a new observation uh, per se. So some clinical trials have shown evidence for in vivo increases in HIV expression. So some amount of kick, uh, but haven't significantly reduced the HIV reservoirs. And I think that there's a lot of different opinions on, on why not, and uh, keen to hear what other people on the call think as well. But just kind of in terms of basic explanations here, uh, the kick we know is, may not be sufficiently strong to reactivate the relevant latent reservoirs just because we're getting some amount of cell-associated RNA doesn't mean that we're exposing uh, enough of the, the reservoir to elimination. Uh, maybe the kill wasn't strong enough. So that was a movie of a very effective T cell. Here's a, another type of T cell, which uh, grabs onto its target cell. And instead of killing it, just kind of gets, uh, gets dragged along until the cell escapes. So there's obviously more, um, more kind of sophisticated ways of, of assessing this, but just, just to illustrate the point that not all cytotoxic T cells are created equal. 
We might have, of course, targeted or measured the wrong infected cell populations. If we measure uh, an area that's, that's, um, that's not relevant to rebound, we might not see a relevant result. And these reservoir harboring cells might be resistant to being eliminated in ways that we don't at the moment fully understand. Maybe these cells are being encountered by immune effectors in vivo on a regular basis. Maybe latency isn't as absolute as we think. Uh, and if that's the case, we need to understand why they're not being cleared uh, from the body. So there are though, of course, some precedents from other studies from non-human primate models in particular that show promise. We're gonna talk a little bit about antibodies now instead of CD8 T cells. So antibodies are typically known for blocking infection of new cells, but they can also bind to the surface of infected cells and target these for killing uh, through natural killer cells, which are similar in many ways to toxic T cells. Um, and this is a process called antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, so ADCC. Amongst all the antibodies, of course, HIV-specific antibodies are present in the blood of uh, almost all people living with HIV. But there are uh, a certain type of these called broadly neutralizing antibodies, which are special because they bind to and neutralize very diverse isolates of HIV. So the virus tends to escape very easily from autologous antibody responses, uh, but there are some antibodies that are much harder to escape from. So this is a study from Dan Baruch's group in collaboration with Gilead. Uh, I think many of you will have seen this. It was recently published in, uh, in Nature, where the animals were infected for a very short period of time. I believe it was seven days, it might have even been, been less, so that is um, one caveat. But after this infection, you see viremia in all of the animals that didn't receive any treatment. And the animals that receive this TLR7, which is probably acting as the kick, but also directly enhances some different immune functions, uh, we see a very similar picture with the BNAB alone, PGT121. So just a single antibody here. There are, of course, other studies that are using combinations of antibodies. We see a lesser rebound, 9 of 11 animals, and to a lower uh, degree. And with the combination, we see that actually 5 of 11 animals don't rebound at all, and those that do have very kind of truncated periods of uh, viremia. So this is very interesting, but will this translate to humans and HIV? And again, I would just flag the really important caveat, which is animals were treated very early. So is this a key component of, uh, of success or not? So uh, take home messages of the, the cure part is therapies aimed at reducing viral reservoirs or reducing remission are showing promise, but I think most people will agree that cure remains a long-term goal unless, unless, uh, unless we get something somewhat uh, unexpected, which of course does happen in medical research from time to time. Uh, basic science research is needed to improve methods of targeting and measuring persistent sorts of sources of viruses. I think this is really an important point. As Linda pointed out, it's also a very active area of research. There are many different assays that are being developed, that are being validated, and, uh, and the dust still has to settle on what assays or combination of assays are going to be kind of the go-to ones. Something that I think is really important, kind of if I had to label one thing that I think is going to be most transformative to the field, it's this understanding that HIV reservoirs are dynamic. Um, some cells are proliferating, some cells are dying. If we understand what it is that's governing these dynamics, then we may have completely new or otherwise improved strategies to reduce uh, HIV reservoirs. Um, so that's my section on, on cure. Before moving on to vaccine, any, uh, any other discussion points? You know, that's really interesting because if we could find out the natural mechanism by which it's destroying itself, I mean, that seems to be so much more safe than these, these LRAs that have not only all these toxicities, but I guess that toxicity is, is one of the main points. I mean, you can't give enough of those LRAs to, to actually be effective and not kill the person, you know, right. or do major damage to the person. So if we looked at it differently as if, okay, how's the body doing this naturally? I mean, it might be much more effective 
and much more safe. I, mean, I know it's complicated, but it sounds, um, I mean, you know, for me, I mean, I like the idea of like block and lock. Like why wake it up? Just make it stay asleep. Now that's a whole nother challenge and that's a whole nother ball of wax. But I mean, this seems to be more in line with what's already happening. And you know what I mean? It's, it makes yeah. sense to me. Yeah, I mean, you know, if if you can alter one or the other side of this equation, right? If you can enhance the death of the cells, or if you can just, as you say, stop those cells from proliferating, let the ones that were going to die die as they were going to, anyways. Then that that might be exactly as you say, a more organic way of uh, of of of, just, of you know shaping the balance a bit. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Anybody else? Cool. Um, good. So moving on to, to vaccine development, and this is kind of a shorter section than the, than the, the previous one, but we talked about broadly neutralizing antibodies and protection. And um, so we talked about these in the context of cure. These also are known to protect from infection in many different animal models. So there's been a lot of humanized mouse studies going back quite a long time now, showing, showing that if you uh, inject humanized mice, if you give them what's called passive immunization with these antibodies, it quite profoundly protects them from being infected. Uh, and this is also the case in monkeys. If you take these human broadly neutralizing antibodies and give them to a monkey, this can uh, profoundly protect them from being infected with, uh, with the SHIV uh, virus. So I think most of the field would agree that if we can elicit these antibodies with a vaccine, that they're likely to be protective. So can this be done? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is, is not easily. Uh, my first job actually in an HIV research lab goes back to uh, 2000, and we were trying to elicit a particular type of broadly neutralizing antibody back then, and I think the story goes back further than that uh, as well. So it's something that has been a long-term effort and one that uh, is still ongoing. And part of the reason why it might be so hard is that these BNABs, probably interesting antibodies, only emerge after years of infection. And they have some unusual features. So they have a lot of different mutations and they have a strange shape with the long, what we call CDR3 loop, uh, which is one of the complementary, complementarity determining regions uh, on the antibody. So it's thought that if we want to elicit these antibodies, it might not be as simple as just giving a single vaccine. We might have to try to understand the steps by which these antibodies develop and acquire these mutations in the body and guide the B cells down an evolutionary path where you have a number of different vaccinations with different engineered antigens, which can, again, just lead them towards these broadly neutralizing antibodies. So this is a complicated uh, goal, but there are a number of fairly recent studies showing some early preliminary encouraging results in animal models, suggesting that at least a few steps down this path uh, have been taken. And the point of this slide is not to go through every detail, but this is from a, a review study uh, from 2018. And what I want to highlight is just the level of sophistication that's being used to try to elicit these antibodies. There are a number of different animal models that are being used for evaluation from guinea pigs, cows, monkeys. Um, after giving what people think are promising vaccines or immunogens, the responses that are elicited are assessed using all of the latest technologies, single cell sorting, a deep sequencing, structural studies, and then the compiled knowledge here is used to go back and redesign the antigen and to iterate on this process. And the idea is to go around and around through this process until uh, a vaccine that can elicit these antibodies is, is developed. So obviously this is gonna be something that requires a lot of persistence, a lot of um, ingenuity. But again, another encouraging story from uh, an animal model is that this elicitation of barley neutralizing antibodies actually works pretty well in, uh, in cows, which were one of the models that we showed on the previous page. So one of the features of these broadly neutralizing antibodies are these really long CDR3 loops, so this weird shape. 
It's an unusual shape for a human antibody, but it turns out to be a pretty normal shape for a cow antibody, which is why the researchers decided to use cows um, as a model. So the hypothesis was that if you just gave one of these carefully designed vaccines to cows, even though they didn't work uh, in people, maybe we could elicit barley neutralizing antibodies in cows. And the results turns out to be uh, very successful. So in black here, this is the breadth of neutralization. So the number of different HIV viruses that the vaccine, uh, that the antibodies cover, and it really gets out to around 100% by this, uh, this late time point. So this helps us hone in on what's gonna be important in overcoming the barriers in people. It suggests that this, this aspect of a long CDR3 loop, uh, the shape of the antibody, might be somewhere we should focus efforts, something we should try to overcome uh, and elicit these types of antibodies uh, in people. And do you still think we're going to need other, other uh, you know, parts of a regimen with the vaccines to really make a difference? Yeah, so I think in order to elicit these types of broadly neutralizing antibodies, we're very likely going to need good CD4 helper responses. In particular, T follicular helper responses are, uh, I think, going to be critical. Um, even though I'm a CD8 T cell guy, I'm going to go on a limb and say that, you know, I think if we actually had just a really good broadly neutralizing antibody response, the data from the animal model suggests that that would probably be enough to protect people from, from infection. Um, of course, having some CD8 responses wouldn't hurt as well, but my, my, my guess is that they may not be uh, critical to protection by this mechanism. Okay, so um, back to the, the human studies. So there was a few promising headlines that came out uh, and then just before I had the talk in Amsterdam, I had to rework the talk for this from uh, Dan Baruch and Julie Makaras uh, talking about this uh, mosaic HIV vaccine in a clinical trial and in rhesus monkeys. So what, is this, what does this mean? Uh, what's really interesting about this study is that the group has designed an approach where they can take carefully matched vaccines that can be tested in rhesus macaques and in people. And the plan then is to measure the immune responses, so this has already been done to some extent, using closely matched assays to look at both the CD8 compartment and the antibody compartment. Uh, the animals then can be challenged with, uh, with a shiv, and what they saw was 67% protection from shiv infection in monkeys. So. Uh, SHIV is not the same as HIV, of course, or even SIV, so that is one caveat, but nonetheless an encouraging initial response. So it was protective in monkeys. What does the resp immune response look like in humans? This is looking at magnitude of antibody responses. We can see the kinetics and the magnitude look pretty similar. Looking just at the magnitude of T cell responses, we can also see they look pretty similar, and there are more in-depth characterizations in the paper. Um, so I think fairly encouraging to think that these responses um, may similarly protect humans from being infected. So based on these results, this is moving forward into a phase 2b efficacy study uh, in 2,600 women in Africa to, of course, ask the question, will this vaccine protect humans from infection uh, as it did for monkeys? And we're just going to have to wait a few years and see if that uh, pans out. Um, so take home messages for vaccines. Again, this part was much shorter than cure, but there are a lot of approaches that are in early stage development. I only talked about a few, but uh, DNA, uh, MVA, adenovirus, replicating vectors, mRNA are just some of the approaches that are being developed. Elicitation of broadly neutralizing antibodies is still kind of a holy grail of the field and has been for some time and it's being pursued through these type of iterative evaluation of these engineered antigens. Uh, 
there's proof of principle in preclinical models, so mice and monkeys, that these broadly neutralizing antibody responses should offer some protection. And finally, that this ad 26 based vaccine uh, showed similar immune responses in monkeys and humans. Uh, it protected monkeys from infection with SHIV, uh, and now we'll see if it'll protect humans from uh, HIV. So there's uh, kind of a, a final uh, segment here, but anything, anyone uh, have any comments on the vaccines? Well, I have a question. <laughs> if people are infected with HIV and they're on antiretroviral therapy, and their viral titers go down to where actually even a, an over-the-counter test uh, could show negative mm -hmm. or very faintly positive. Uh, how long or, or do you anticipate um, you know, these vaccines to be uh, at a level enough that they would be protective? So this is in the setting of a therapeutic vaccine. So you, you give it to someone who is living with HIV and the goal is to prevent viral rebound. Is that, is that, is that right in the question? Well, no, even if you're doing it to prevent uh, infection, you know, how long will that have the potential of preventing? Because if, they, if the virus, uh, if the antibody levels go down um, to a certain point, it may not be protective anymore. Right. No, that's, that's obviously, that's a very good question. I think it's going to depend a lot on the quality of the vaccine and, and the levels of the antibodies that we need to confer protection. And, and I don't think we know until we'll have something that, that works to some extent. But of course, there are examples of vaccines that confer lifelong protection uh, of licensed vaccines currently and very durable responses. A lot of those are against live attenuated vaccines, such as yellow fever vaccines, um, something like that is right. not. But these are retroviruses. Right. So that's the, the difference there. Now, I know there was a recent paper that was discussing about IgM um, being protective in uh, vaginal um, transmission or infection of HIV. I don't know if you're aware of that paper. I think it just came out in the last couple of months. I can't recall who the authors were. Uh, it's interesting that an IgM being such an early response type antibody would have, you know, a, a powerful response of protection. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen that, that study. So, but this was a vaccine illicit IgM or this was this was thought to be yeah i believe it was i'm trying to recall the details what i can do is i can make sure linda gets a copy of that paper and she can forward it on to you yeah that would be great i'd like to look at that that'd be interesting okay. yeah and i guess you know the point is is well taken about the fact that it's uh that, that it's a retrovirus versus some of these other infections you know the question is i guess can we actually have an immune response that will give really sterilizing protection so that no cells will be infected uh, with HIV to begin with. And for a lot of the vaccines that are, that are effective, it's, it's really hard to tell actually if they, are, if they prevent any cells from being infected in the first place or if there's just a small, um, small enough seeding of infection that it gets cleared. And if it's the latter scenario, then for retrovirus, obviously that's also going to be a um, challenge as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting. What do you think about, um, you know, I mean, there's so many differences between the, the, um, the monkey research and human beings. I mean, being able to give people as much of a dose or getting them, you know, right after they're infected and all those sorts of things. I mean, is that going to really, how relevant is all that, that, that sort of animal research going to be? Yeah, that's the big question, right? I think we always have to keep asking that question because it's a massive investment of resources and, um, and it's really serving as the gatekeeper for a lot of things to move forward. I think the best answer is it's a, it's a model which uh, has some value but also has some limitations. One of the things that struck me from the last NIH Cure meeting I, that I think is probably important in the context of what we've talked about today is that in these, in these rhesus macaques, they weren't seeing evidence for clonal expansion of the reservoir. 
uh, in the data that were presented by Bob Silicano. So if we think that this clonal expansion and this waxing and waning of the reservoir is important to persistence, then it might not be a footnote to note that this clonal expansion doesn't seem to be happening in non-human primates. So I think that's, that was something that raised some debate at the NIH meeting, um, and for me is a, a bit of a, a cause for, for concern. Um, on the other hand, you know, it's still, it's still a lentiviral infection. There are, there's an awful lot of similarities between the two. The fact that we can actually get durable remission in some of these monkey studies, I think, has provided a reasonable rationale for moving forward with clinical trials. So the TLR7 antibody study that I presented earlier is, I believe, in the clinic now, as some of you may have probably have a better, <laughs> a better finger on the pulse of that than I do, but Gilead is moving that forward. And I guess we're going to find out whether or not these NHP studies are predictive uh, or not. Right. I, mean, I think it's a very good tool for toxicity, too. I mean, that's really helpful, I think. Yeah, absolutely. But I think um, this, is, this is where we need also, obviously, guidance and, and, and buy-in and uh, feedback from, from the community. It's if there is an intervention that, that is ready to go into people and that is considered acceptable in terms of toxicity profiles to go into people, uh, and there's a strong rationale in that regard, then my own position is that if it makes sense and we can bypass the animal models, then you know, that might be the way to go because the animal models might also give us false negatives. I mean, it's possible that things that don't work in that system that, that would have worked otherwise. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but you know, um, or I don't know if you have an opinion, I guess, but you know, it's interesting to see people doing two combinations of two things or, you know, looking at one thing and then another sort of sequential learning as it were. And then we have Steve doing his, his um, vaccine protocol that has five or six interventions. So, right. I mean, to me, uh, it, it, it'll take us 50 years to do two things at a time. And, you know, the, the, the studies like Steve's with more, more interventions might be what we need and tell us more. Um, but then again, how do we know what, who's doing what to who, you know, from a regulatory sort of perspective? I mean, I'm glad the FDA gave them the okay, but it makes you think. Um, I think it's it's a different approach from what we've taken so far, and 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 let's let's see. I mean, I guess the rationale is if we see an effect, we can tease apart what was important after. But if we can see a real effect, then we'll be in a pretty good spot, I guess. Right. Right. Very interesting. Wow, a lot in one hour. That's for sure. Yeah, and the, the, there's a there's a few other slides here I can go through, kind of. Quickly, if, if you like, this, this was the part. This was kind of, uh, you know, more for the the big stage uh, and the kind of inspirational message. But it might, I think it's you know fun to share, uh, anyways. So uh, you know, the story is is one about how kind of past epidemics can sow the seeds of cures into the future in unpredictable ways. Making a link here with how the Delta thirty two mutation arose and how it's now essentially a source of inspiration. So you'll all know, of course, the uh, Timothy Ray Brown's case of a cure with CCR5 Delta 32. Um, and I think what uh, some of you will also know is that where this mutation came from, it seems like it was selected by some past pandemic, which would have caused a lot of death and a lot of loss in its, in its time. Uh, and a small proportion of the population that had this mutation would have preferentially survived. So that's how it became fixed. We don't know if it was smallpox or if it was uh, the plague. There's some debate over that, but it was clearly selected by some past pandemic in kind of uh, Northwestern Europe. So this uh, past tragedy sowed the seeds of cure by selecting for this mutation uh, into the future until they were discovered, of course, by um, 
by basic science research implemented by pioneering clinicians and, and uh, Timothy Ray Brown's participation. So one thing I want to point out, and I think you'll all be aware, is that the HIV research enterprise that we're conducting now in close partnership with people living with HIV and, uh, and the community, such as, such as those of you on the call, uh, is really sowing seeds of discovery that can similarly cross-fertilize other areas of research, not through blind selection, such as how CCR5 was selected, but in other more modern ways. And we can already point to cases where discoveries in HIV science have contributed to cures of other disease. So people will be familiar with anti-PD-1 because it's also under exploration for HIV cure. The, the first demonstration that anti-PD-1 could enhance human immune responses came from samples from people living with HIV, from Bruce Walker, Rafiq Sekely, and Rick Kaup's groups. So PD-1 had been discovered in mouse models, but this was the first example of translating it uh, to humans. And now anti-PD-1 immunotherapy is really transforming the treatment of cancer, uh, saving lives of people with melanoma. The list of cancers that are treated continues uh, to grow. Um, so this is a, our, our logo for Believe is the, the dandelion. We are um, hoping that we can cast uh, the seeds of HIV into, in, or cast HIV into the wind here. And we managed to convince uh, Timothy Ray Brown to take a picture here on the steps of the Washington Monument. Great picture, great picture. <laughs> Thank you. And this is representing, of course, the, the seeds of, of scientific discovery and cures that, uh, that we hope that our collective efforts are going to cast into the future uh, beyond the HIV epidemic. And just as the CCR5 mutation has given rise to unexpected cures, what we're finding now uh, might similarly do so long into the future. So that's my, my, my inspirational wrap-up message. That's really great. You know, it's funny, we've been talking about on the list for the last couple of days, um, and I think our gene therapy friends from Washington were still on the call, about, um, um, you know, what Rich Ambinder from Hopkins was talking about, there was a paper too about somebody thinking that they had another eradication case, but anyway, Rich Ambinder through this um, Delta 32 to sort of um, uh, allogeneic transplant, and Rich Ambinder at Hopkins was talking about um, partial match transplants as opposed to the exact matches and the, you know the, the, the stuff that's been required in the in the in the, it's, it's a gold standard now and that he thinks he could probably eradicate um, HIV in, I mean yeah HIV in, in certain cancer patients by using these partial um, allogeneic transplants. Have you heard that? Have you thought about that? Does that make sense to you? Or is yeah, it I, I, I'm, absolutely. So in, in that study as well, in addition to relying essentially on the, on the graft versus, um, you know, host effect there, there's also an additional component with Kath Bollard where they're going to be expanding HIV specific T cells in, in the donor cells. So those are the cells from the HIV negative uh, donor. And Kath has a way of priming HIV specific T cells from these HIV negative cells as well. So I would actually, I mean, to me, that's one of the most exciting projects that's going forward at the moment. It's not something that's gonna be readily scalable, of course. We are only, they're only doing those bone marrow transplants in, in, in people who have to have them for various types of cancer. Um, but you have the reservoir already knocked down to a great degree by this immunoablation. You have the graft, which is going to be somewhat allo-reactive against the remaining cells. And if you have some residual HIV-specific T cells, which are matched on half of the alleles of the target cells, you might have also that specific antiviral effect um, coming into play as well. So to me, I think that's a powerful potential combination. Uh, we're actually now I actually talked to some clinicians the other day about whether we can get blood from siblings, HIV negative siblings of people living with HIV so that we can start modeling some of those experiments in, uh, in humanized mouse models. That's great. And, uh, and the, I, I thought it was going to be a very difficult ask, but the clinician told me that uh, pointed to a study they had previously where they were able to get five identical twins of discordant twins, one of whom was 
HIV positive, one of whom is HIV negative. So I think uh, getting siblings to do those experiments should be pretty much uh, straightforward. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Well, anybody have any other questions? Most of our more vocal people weren't on today, but I think Mark from I4C made up for it. So there's some really great, really great, uh, you know, comments and suggestions. It was mm -hmm. a pleasure. Anybody else? Well, thank you, Brad. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, great. So anybody else before we let Brad go? We're a little bit over, but I thought it was really worthwhile. The end was really interesting too. That was a lot of information in one one uh, presentation. Very clear and and very help you th helpful. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity, uh, Linda and everyone. And uh, yeah, feel free if anyone has suggestions or questions or comments, you can reach out to me by email as well. Okay, all right, great. Thanks everybody. We appreciate your participating today. Thanks again. All right, bye-bye. Okay, bye.